Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen again. God is good how often? And all the time. Look over there, somebody don't get too close. Say neighbor, God loves you. And I do too. And if you love me as much as I love you, then nothing can break our love in two. Well, I woke up early this morning. My heart was beating right on time. I said, Lord, I truly thank you for opening up these eyes of mine. Brother Dixon, then I went over to the window while I was peeping out the shade. Once again, I had to tell him, thank you, Lord, for letting me see another day. Now, the sun was brightly shining and the wind was blowing not too strong. And in the treetop just a few feet away, Brother Robin was singing a song. Now, Brother Thorne, I don't know what he was saying. And pretty soon he was on his way. But who's to say he wasn't being grateful saying, Lord, thank you for another day. Now, I know that Robin had enough sense to say thank you. Now, I know we ought to have that too on this morning. Because I believe we're more blessed than Robin, amen, somebody. God woke us up this morning and started us on our way. We are blessed individuals on this morning. In the middle of a pandemic, we're blessed people. In the middle of strife, we're blessed people. Death all around us, yet and still, we are blessed people. Who are we that God should be mindful of us? We are nobody, yet and still, God thinks about us every day that we wake up. New mercies that we see every morning. Great is the Lord's faithfulness. He is so good. And that that is why you came out on this morning. You didn't came out so we can see that nice dress, that nice suit. You came out so that you can worship and praise God's holy and his divine name for what he has done in your life. For the child of God recognizes that if you praise him from now until your death date, you still be insufficient. It still would not be enough. So Lord, while I got this chance, while I got this opportunity right here, I'm going to praise the Lord. Amen. So good to see everyone that has come out on this morning, as well as always those that are watching us via live stream. We want to let you know, thank you for watching and tuning in. And we pray that you would share, start a watch party, invite somebody to church here um, on this morning. Um, that was a little boy. We're going to call him Johnny. Everybody say Johnny. Little Johnny um, was late to Sunday school one morning, and his teacher knew that Johnny was always on time for Sunday school, so when he came in, she was like, Johnny, you know, everything okay? He said, yeah, everything's okay. I was going to go fishing, but my daddy told me I should go to church instead. And she looked at little Johnny with a smile. She said, that's amazing. She said, did your daddy tell you the importance of coming to church rather than going fishing? He said, yeah, he didn't have enough bait for both of us. <laughs> Genesis chapter 16. Genesis chapter 16, beginning at verse number 1. And I, uh, you would indulge me, I would like to read the entire chapter on this morning. Ain't nothing wrong with that, is it? Genesis chapter 16. Genesis chapter 16, the grass withers, and the flower thereof shall fade away. But the word of God shall stand forever. This is week 9. Next week will be our last week with Abraham. And, um, but on today is a message that... Um, Maybe some of us will be able to identify with. I don't know, so I'm going I'm to I'm wait till you see the title of the lesson, and then I'll let you uh, tell on yourself. Genesis chapter 16. Genesis chapter 16, we're going to begin at verse number 1. You there say, preach, I'm waiting. All right, Genesis chapter one, uh, 16, beginning at verse number 1. Now Sarah, Abram's wife, bare him no children, and she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian. And after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife, and he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived, and when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarah said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee, I have given my maid into thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes, the Lord judged between me and thee. But Abram said unto Sarah, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. In other words, that's your problem. 
Do to her as it pleases thee. And when Sarai dwelt hard with her, she fled from her face. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence cometh thou, and whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress, and submit thyself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, thou art with child, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And she called the name of the Lord that spoke to her, Thou God that seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Wherefore the well was called Berelahi Rope. Behold, it is between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bare Abram a son, and Abram called his son's name, which Hagar bare Ishmael. And Abram was fourscore and six years old. Somebody say 86 years old. When Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Check it, you can put the title up there now. Our subject on this morning is caught in an entanglement. Caught in an entanglement. If you need a working definition of entanglement, just think about Jada Pinkett Smith and August Alcina and Will Smith. You'll get the entanglement that I'm talking about. You know, it is amazing the depths that God's people are willing to go to get what they want. Here is Abram, a man that has left everything to follow God by faith. He believed in God enough to leave his homeland, to leave his father and his family behind. He has trusted God through battles. He trusted God through trials that would have made many men turn around and go home in defeat. Yet for all his faith and for all of his good deeds, Abram at the end of the day is still a man. He's still made in sinful flesh. And there is still within him a pull towards the world and the desires of this world. We all know what this passage is about. You've heard this a million times. Sarai and Abram try to help God give them a son by having Abram take Sarai's maidservant, Hagar, as his wife. Of course, this was not and never was God's intention for their lives. But as with us, this did not stop them from rushing ahead of God anyway and doing what they wanted to do. Their decision brought with it consequences for them and for the world that we live in today. And as we have this time this on this morning, I want to deal with caught up in an entanglement. And there are just three points I want to deal with. And the first one is the reason for the entanglement. While all the reasons behind this entanglement are far too many to mention, there are three that warrant mention here on this morning. And that is... They were seeking acceptance. In the day and in the society that they lived in, it was considered a disgrace for a couple not to have a child. It was considered a disgrace for them to be going along childless. And in our day, you know, many couples choose that lifestyle for themselves and that is okay. And others have that choice forced upon them by physical reasons. And in Abram's day, regardless of the reasons behind it, if a couple had no children, they were mocked, they were looked down upon, and largely they were not accepted into the society. This was a society that was almost thought nothing of multiple marriages. You could marry as many folk as you wanted to, but yet if you didn't have any children, 
they look down upon you. If a man like Abram were to take Hagar as his concubine or his secondary wife, nobody around them would think anything about it. If that concubine would bear a child, it would be considered to be the child of the first or the primary wife. It wouldn't even be considered to be Hagar's child. It would be Sarai's child. And in this way, Sarai could get the child she desired to be accepted within the community that they lived in. Now note this, God's children are often guilty of lowering their standards to those of the community around them to fit in better. Have you ever seen that our people just to fit in with a certain crowd or a certain group of people or to be accepted by a certain group of people, they are willing to leave their standards at the church, at the house, and just go out and succumb and do any and everything that they can just so they can have a feeling of being accepted. Man, if you can't accept me the way I am, then evidently you don't want me. If you can't accept me with the way that I'm living and the way that I'm striving to be, then evidently you don't want to be a part of my life. You should never give up your standard. You should never sell yourself short in order to fit in with somebody that ain't even got no standards. There must be a clear line of demarcation between people of the Lord and people of the world. There are many people that are falling into this trap because so many of us, we think that the Christian life is boring. We think that the Christian life is mundane. We think that there are too many rules and too many regulations to be kept if you are going to be a child of God. Let me tell you, you can be saved and still have fun. Amen, somebody? You can be a child of God and still live a prosperous life. You ain't got to be out there doing all kind of fools and shoot them up, bang, bang. You ain't got to be out there doing all kind of stuff like that. But you can live a life that is enjoyable as well as pleasing in the eyesight of God. They had some baggage that they were dragging. The Bible tells us that Hagar was an Egyptian. She was part of the possessions that Abram brought back with him when he went down there in Egypt. Now, and he had he had never journeyed to that country. That would have been, had he never went down to Egypt, there wouldn't be no Hagar for him to get caught up with. I said, had he never even went down. Into it. Had you had never went to the place that you were not supposed to be, first of all, you would have never gotten caught up in the entanglement that you are in right now. How many of us have went somewhere, done something, you know you ain't had no business doing it before you did it, and now, later on down the road, months down the road, years down the road, you are seeing what you did play out in your very own life. Can I tell you something? You cannot do wrong and get away. Your sins eventually will find you out. Your sins eventually, they will find you out. Now, he is still reaping what he sold in Egypt. God will always get you quick. Sometimes he'll let you go on and think that you're getting back. Sometimes he'll say, oh, everything just going well. You feel like, oh, you just bless it. God say, okay, now you think everything's all right here. I got something for you right here that's going to challenge your faith. Can I tell you something? You never go, you never get out of sin better than you were when you went in. You never go in sin and come out spotless. You never go in sin and come out clean. There's always some kind of reminder, some evidence that you were there. This is the law of sowing and reaping. Genesis 15, 1 through 6 tells the story of God's promise to Abram. When the promise was given, Abram reacted in faith. But as time goes by, Abram has began to doubt a little bit. He and Sarah decides that God needs some help. He ain't acting quick enough. He, he, you know, I, I believe Abram at some point in time must have had some instant grits. And at some point in time, he must have had some instant coffee. 
And at some point in time, he must have had some instant mashed potatoes because he didn't want to wait to give God time to do what he had already told them that he was going to do. But yet it says, God, you take it just a little bit too long. I'm going to have to go along and help you out with your plan. After all, God only said that Abram would father a son. He didn't say whom the mother of that son would be. It is my conviction that doubt towards the word and the promises of God accounts for more of our troubles than any other thing in our life. Because so many times we allow circumstances and situations to cause us to doubt the power of God and to doubt what God is able to do. When we so soon forget that our God is bigger than any problem we'll ever have. He's bigger than any situation that we'll ever face. Somebody just say, my God is bigger. Now, that was the reaction to the entanglement. Now, all three of these particulars in this entanglement reacted differently to the situation. All three reacted differently, as if they was in three different places. But it is worthy to note that all three reacted badly. By the way, when sin and its problems, or any problem from any source for that matter, arrives in your life, most of the people in this room will react to it in one of the three ways that I'm about to share with you. And number one, you react by being unaccountable. Abram tried to pretend that there was no problem and that if there was a problem, it was Sarah's to deal with. Sister said, oh no, nah, bro, you can't put that on us. No, no. He totally ignored his responsibility in the whole situation. You see how many people try to deal with their problems by ignoring them? Oh, it ain't nothing. It ain't an issue. And we know when you don't deal with the issue in its infant stages, after a while you will find something that was a small issue that is now turned into a big issue. This will never work. It is left a set of small problems grow into bigger problems. You remember when David ignored the problem of Amnon and Tamar? And the problem grew until Absalom took matters into his own hands and killed his brother. Therefore, therefore, whether it be a problem in the home, whether it's a problem on the job, whether it's a problem in your community, in your school, in the body of Christ, it must be confronted and dealt with or it's going to get out of hand. Just ask April. Now, Sarah reacted by being unreasonable. Sarai was miserable because of the pride and the haughtiness of Hagar. Yeah. Like she wasn't the one that sat in there to be with her husband. Yeah. So she tried to make everyone else around her miserable too. She tried to blame Abram for the problem. She tried to blame Hagar for the problem. She even tried to bring God into the issue. She fleshed out the proverb, if mama ain't happy, they can go preach them up. If, if, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. But no, there are many who approach the problems of life with this kind of attitude. If they are unhappy, they want everybody else around them to be unhappy as well. So they get grouchy. They walk around mean-spirited short-tempered and become hard to get along with. Least we forget that is not a Christ-like response to trouble and problems. That is not the way that the child of God ought to respond. But he would have us to learn to handle the problems of life without attaching others or attempting to make them as miserable as we are. Hagar reacted by being unavailable. Hagar decided that the answer to her problem was to run away. You know, you know, the flight or fight response. She decided to take flight. She had to get up out of there. She said, you know what? I don't know what y'all that got me all mixed up and construed in. I got to get up out of here. She looking at me crazy. I got to sleep with one eye open. I don't know if she's going to put a pillow over my face. I don't know what's going to happen. I got 
I'm just keep it one eye open. Because this man and this woman just won't leave me alone. <laughs> Hagar decided that the answer to her problem was to run away. She just packed up and left away from the problem. This is the most common response of all of them. Yeah. When problems arise in the church, we don't seek a solution, we seek a new church. When problems arise on the job, even though you know you'd have been late 10 them times, <laughs> instead of trying to correct yourself, I'm turning my two week notice. If I get y'all, I'm going to find me another job. When problems come up in your marriage, <laughs> instead of going there and saying, baby, I'm sorry, we go out and find another baby. <laughs> instead of trying to get the solution, we always seem somehow to make the problems even worse than they already are. Yeah. You remember the giants of Canaan and the children of Israel? Oh, yeah. They ran from them the first time in Numbers 13 and 14. But before their descendants could claim the land, they had to be faced and they had to be defeated. Before you can get over this hill, before you can get over this problem, before you can get over this issue, you got to face the problems that are evident in your life. You know you got issues. Stop acting like you got it all together. Everything is perfect and that you don't do no wrong. You know you need help and the only one that can help you is God Almighty. I want to call your attention to the fact that God sent Hagar back to the house. God sent her back to the family. No, no, no. Y'all created this mess. Now you're going to have to deal with the mess. Had you did what I told you to do in the first place, you wouldn't even be in this mess that you caught up in. But now that you have made it, you made your bed hard. Now you got to lay in it. God told her in verse number nine, go back. go back, return from which you have came. And not only when you go back, I want you to go back and submit yourself. Ooh. So you mean to tell me I ain't just got to go back and act like ain't nothing happened. But I got to go back and submit my man, she's trying to kill me. Man, she the reason I gotta sleep in one hour, but she the reason I can't. I, I'm looking around, you know, like like something about to happen. I don't know what she's gonna do to me. And you telling me I gotta submit to her? He did this for several reasons. But among them is the fact that God intended to use this situation to help each of them understand that you got to face your problems. Abram had to face it. Sarah had to face it. Hagar had to live in it. God's business isn't to make you happy. It's to make you holy. God could care less if you happy, if you cheesing and grinning and smiling like a chess cake. God could care less about that if your life is raggedy, if your life is in shambles, if you are not living the way that God has called you to be. He ain't worried about your happiness. God desires for you to live holy. He said, be ye holy for I am holy. If you read it backwards, it say, holy am I and holy ye be. Whether you read it straight or back, it tell you the same thing. You got to be holy. God told them you're going to have to deal with the issue. Now, forcing you to face your problems is one way to get to the solution that you are seeking. And then the third thing was the results of the entanglement. Yeah. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 15 says, good understanding giveth favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. Numbers 32 and 23 says, be sure your sins will find you out. These and other verses remind us of the truth that sin brings with it 
troubles and trials. The situation before us this morning is no different. Ishmael is called a wild man. Many parents seem to be determined to raise their own wild men and young women. Amen, somebody. Through lack of standards. Through, through, through the lack of discipline in their own home. And, and, and you know what is allowed to happen in the home. Sooner or later, it's going to show up out in public. They're going to cuss you out in Walmart. They're going to they gonna tell you what they ain't going to do while you out around somebody. After a while, what you allow to go on in the house, they're going to make you shame out in public. And then you listen like, oh, why would you do that? Why? No, you know what is practice in the house. You know what you allow them to do. You know, you, yeah. who you ever known 13, 14 years old coming in the house 2, 3 o'clock in the morning? They just kids. They out enjoying themselves. They ain't doing that wrong. I'm not going to raise my kids like mama and them raised me. I'm glad God brought me up in a house when I went and left. Mama knocked me back right. I'm glad God raised me up in a house when I went out doing stuff that I wasn't not supposed to do. Whether I was 6 or 16, God put a whipping on my backside. God put me in a place where you got corrected if you got out of line. That's the problem with us today. We don't have no accountability. Don't nobody want to correct nobody. Don't nobody want to say nothing to nobody. But if you see danger coming up down the road, you need to warn somebody. That's why so many of our young black men in jail right now. That's why so many of our young black men out of the graveyard somewhere right now. Because then nobody want to tell them the right thing to do. Yo, you want to be their friend. Let them pay the light bill. Let them pay the gas bill. Let them pay a car note. Let them pay some insurance. Let them pay that phone bill. Let them, and, and this is the thing. You, if your child is still in your house, and I say, you need to be aware of what they got going on. You need to be aware of who they communicate with, what they got going on, because there are people out here ready and willing to take advantage of somebody the second they get a chance. He would be called a wild man. And by being a wild man, he would be difficult to handle. Not only was he going to be difficult to handle, but he was going to be aggressive towards other people. Ishmael represents the difficulties that arise when sin is allowed to take us off of God's path for our lives. Remember, sin brings in its own club. Sin brings in its own party. Ishmael is a picture of that truth. What might your sin give birth to in your life? As Ishmael grew, the tension surrounding him grew as well. Now she had to sleep with both eyes open. She didn't know where Sarah was coming from. In other words, the sin of Abram and Sarai, even after many years, still brought heartache and trouble into their home. I would just remind you that your sins, no matter how small, no matter how insignificant you may think them to be, they always affect you and those that are around you. They poison your spirit, sabotage your family, and they hinder your walk with God. Many families are burdened this morning by the so-called hidden sins of that family. The answer to sin is to put it out in the light. Not cover it up. The answer to sin is to put it out in the light. Sin cannot live when it is brought out of darkness and into the marvelous light of the glory of God. Now, even though sin was accomplished by the will of men, it was going to be used for the glory of God. Those involved could not see how things would play out in our day. Yet much of the trouble the world is dealing with right now, especially in the Arab world, is a direct result of Abram's sin with Hagar. So can you see something that they did thousands of years ago? It's having problems going on up until this day. You see nothing. Even our sins 
catches God by surprise. It ain't surprise God that you back down on bended knee over the same issue for the 75th time. It, ha it, has it, it hasn't surprised him. It has surprised him. When God made you, he know he gave you a, what we gonna call a malfunction. When God created you, he know he left some screws missing out some places. But when God created you, he knew that there was some leaks within the ship. He knew that there was some, some issues going on. But I'm so glad he loved me past my issues. I'm so, I'm so glad he loved me past my shortcomings. I'm so glad he loved me past my wrongdoing. Because if God really gave us what we deserve, wouldn't be nobody here. The, the little babies, they would be in here. But you know what? Far, far as us, wouldn't be nobody up in here this morning. Because if God gave us what we would have deserved, we would have been expired a long time ago. We would have been expired a long time ago. But just like Abram, even though Abram and Sarai, they messed up, they did wrong. They tried to help God out with his plan. God could have killed Abram and Sarai right there on the spot. Tell you know what, y'all done went out and did something that I ain't told you to do. I'm going to find somebody else that's going to do what I have called them to do. But God said, you know what, you did wrong. Yeah. Now you're going to have to live every day looking in the face of your sin. Ishmael ain't going nowhere. Every day you wake up, you're going to be faced with the sin that you commit. You're going to be faced with your wrongdoing. So many areas of our lives have probably been touched by this message. While we live in this world, we have sins, we have trials, we have troubles. But don't let that be an excuse for you to just blatantly do wrong. For you to just blatantly sin. Oh, well, he gonna forgive me. I might as well do it. I still got time. I might as well do what I want to do. I might as well have fun right now. You know, I don't know how much fun I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be able to have had they just waited on God. Had they just waited for what he promised them to come to pass. We wouldn't even, even have Genesis 16 going on right here. We wouldn't even have this issue. And to think, this is the same woman that when God made them the promise, the Bible says that Hagar, she, was, she wasn't visible. She was off somewhere. She was listening to the conversation that was happening. And the Bible didn't say that she laughed out loud. Ha ha. The Bible says that she laughed within herself. God said, tell her I heard a laugh. So you mean to tell me he knows my thoughts while they're still a fault? You mean to tell me if she knew that he had power like that, don't you think he had power to bring about the child, the promise that he already told you was going to happen? But you see how when things don't happen, in our timeline, when things don't happen the way that we want them to happen in the means that we want them to happen, we feel somehow God has forgotten. We feel somehow God is not worried about our issue, and so we want to go ahead and help God out. You can't help yourself. How are you going to help God? If we could help ourselves, we wouldn't need him. But without God, y'all, we are nothing. Without God, we can't do nothing. Apart from him, we have no strength. Apart from him, we have no ability. Everything that you do, you're doing it on his power. The car that you drive, you're driving it on his power. The house that you're living in, you're living in it on his power. I know you pay the bill, but he makes sure the funds are there. I know you go and punch the clock in, but he makes sure your legs and your arms work so you can operate and do what you need to do to accumulate some income to take care of your house. It's all because of his power. And if he decide to cut off the power source, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. I know, and I'm not a fortune teller, 
I'm nobody's prophet, but I know every single person in this building is dealing with some sin. I don't care if you've been in the church 60 years. I don't care if you've been in the church 40, 30, six days. However long you've been in, you've been confronted with some issues. You've been confronted with some problems. You've been confronted with some Some of us thought we had gotten rid of those demons years ago. And you recognize all it took was the right situation. And it brings those demons. Can I tell you something? When desire and opportunity meet, the Pope is bound to sin. Can I tell you something? When, 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 when opportunity and desire meet, anyone is subject to anyone. Everybody, no matter how good we try to dress up, no matter how good we try and smell, no matter how, how good we try to appear in front of in individuals within ourselves, we got a sin issue. Within ourselves, we got a problem and the only way you're going to get better, the only way you're going to get over the problem, you got to address it. You got to address it. Stay out of environments that harbor that kind of stuff. Because once you continue to place yourself within an environment, how, how you, how you going to be made better if everywhere you go, what you're trying to get away from, here it is. Here it is, here it is. I don't care how many self-help books you read. I don't care how much you uh, watch the yellow ones on. I don't care how many Oprah shows you watch. I don't care what you do. At the end of the day, you still got a sin problem. Yes. Amen. You still got some issues. And so many of us, some people for years been walking around harboring sin. Yeah. Why can't I be blessed? Check out your sin. Why can't I progress? Look at your sin. And the thing about it, we think that we get by just because ain't nobody at the church saw us yet. We think we get by just because we ain't got caught up yet. All along, on the road, to the soul's true abode, there's an all see and eye watching you. Every step that you make, this great eye, he is awake. There's an all see and eye watching you. We love to say only God. I'm sure somebody here probably got a tattoo say only God can judge me. <laughs> and, and, and we'd be so quick to holler out man, you, you only God can judge me. That's what you need to be worried about. <laughs> I could care less what any feeble put their pants on one leg at a time like me man got to say. I'm more concerned with what he got to say about my life. I'm more concerned with him looking down at me and saying, good job. Well done, good and faithful servant. So since we know and we profess that only God can judge us, let's live like only God can judge us. Because he is the one. He is the only one that's going to have the book. He's the only one that's going to have the record book. And even those sins that you buried a long time ago, if you never got it right with him, it's coming up again. It's coming up again. It's coming. You can go out right there and you can plant that seed as deep in the ground as you want it to. When it comes time for it to bloom, something coming up out that ground. And you're going to be able to see evidence of what was planted. Be careful what you sow. Yes, Lord. Be, make sure what you sow, you want to reap it. Make, make sure. So many of us done people wrong, wonder why everybody doing you wrong. <laughs> lying on folk, wonder why people keep lying on us. Talking, oh, can't wait till we get home so we can get on the phone and talk about folk. Wonder why people talking about you. 
you'd have been on the job, going to somebody else's position, going to the boss, talking about the person. They ain't doing this, they ain't doing that. And now you wonder why everybody rattled up trying to get you off the job. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder could it be? What goes around? Go, I don't I can I don't care how much strength I have, I can throw that boomerang as far as I want it to go. And eventually, it's gonna make its way right back. And let me tell you, it ain't too fun when the rabbit got the gun. For those y'all that know what that means, it ain't too fun. It's all well and good. As long as you are the one doing wrong. But then when somebody else does wrong towards you, oh, you on CBS to talk about it. We wanted to make the front page. Look at what they did to me. What have you done? You know, that's the biggest issue in COVID. You know, that's the biggest issue of Christians. So concerned with everybody else. And don't even know what's going on in your own life. So concerned with how they living, what they doing, who at their house, why they had that. It ain't none of your business. You paying bills now? You keep it like you paying the rent? You buying it because you put food on it? It ain't your business. You got enough in your own life to correct and worry about. Keep your nose out of other folks' business. William brothers wrote a song a long, long while ago. Sweep around your own front door before you try sweep around mine. We make sure that everybody else in the neighborhood's porch is good and clean and dirt just piling up in front of our house. That's why he said, work out your own. Not everybody else's. Work out your own soul salvation with fear and with trembling. And can you see that principle with the life of Abraham and Sarah? Stop trying to put the blame off on somebody else. Yes, Lord. You played a part in this too. Amen. You did wrong just like the other people did wrong. Own up to what you have done and it's only after you have owned up to it that you have admitted it, that you've let God know that you're sorry for what you've done, that you can now work towards getting better. Yes, Amen. But I'm afraid that so many of God's children will meet him in an unpleasing way because we let our sins just shame us out. We, we, try to, we try to hide and we try to keep things hidden just so that we'll, we'll appear to you know, be this and appear to be that. Your soul is too important for you to go around and try to be camouflaged. Your, 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 your soul is too important for you to waste precious time that God has afforded you. We need to wake up. We need to, we need to wake up and we need to get right. Make right with people that you've made wrong with. I, 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 I know people in your life that you got issues with, you ain't talking to them. Go back and make it right. People in your family, sisters and brothers, you don't like them, ain't spoke to them yet. You need to make it right. Go and talk to them. That even if you weren't the one that did wrong, go back and make a man. Life is too short for you to be walking around mad and upset with somebody over something that don't amount to a hill of beans. Make it right. Go back. Don't be afraid to tell somebody you sorry that you did wrong. All have seen. Yeah. And come short of what preaching that's past tense. Five minutes ago was in the past tense. Yeah. All of us have seen. Yeah. And come short of his glory. Yeah. But when you do fall, be glad that you can get back up. Yes, man. You don't have to wallow in the hall pit. Yes. You don't have to stay down just because you got knocked down. Yes. Get back up. Yeah. Dust yourself off. And keep on marching down the king's highway. Life is fading. Eternity is sure. So why not prepare yourself for that great day? My brother, my sister, hopefully none of us have been caught in an entanglement like Abram, Sarah, and Hagar 
If you did, they, they, we, ain't, we ain't even on that. But I know all of us have been caught up in sin. Everybody has been caught up in wrongdoing. But when you get caught, when you find yourself in the midst of sin, don't try to put it off on nobody else. Don't run away from the issue. Don't act like the issue is not there. Address it. Talk to the Lord about it. You know, it's good to have God, but also if you need to go sit on somebody's couch, that's good too. That's why he put them here. You, you know, you know, and people say, Oh, I, I got God. You just good. And he's a wonderful counselor. Thank him. Yes. But you need to take advantage of those things that God has given us. A lot of us walking around here with some deep-rooted issues. Yes, yes. And it's gonna take some time for you to get over that. But addressing it is the first step. Yes. Addressing those issues that you have in this life and correcting yourself yes. so that what I had issues with on yesterday, I don't struggle with it as much on today and prayerfully by God's will on tomorrow what was my ceiling will now be my floor yeah. Yeah. amen if you are here today if you are here today you are not a child of God your sins have not yet been washed away by the blood of the lamb you are not a member of the body of Christ which is the church of Christ my friend and my brother I gotta ask you what you waiting on what, what, what are we waiting on to make the greatest decision that we could ever make in our life and that is to decide to make Jesus the head of our life. He is the only one that can take your black soul, dip it in red blood, and then come out white as snow. He is the only one that can take you, clean you up, and make you new. And once he gets done with you, the Bible says that you, you rise to, to walk up in a new way of living. You got a, you got a new way of life. You got a new way about yourself. Since you have come in contact with Jesus, you come by hearing this word, believing the same repenting of your sins, confessing Christ as your Savior, being buried with him in baptism, have your sins washed away, done away with, never come up before you in this life, but neither the life that is to come. And the Lord himself will add you to his body. But can I tell you something? That same Bible also says that if you die in your sin, where God is, you cannot go. That's simple. I, that don't need any exegesis, eisegesis, esthetic. It don't need any of that. If you die in your sin, where he is, which is where we're trying to go, where he is, you cannot go. So let's make sure that when the Lord calls, we'll be able to answer. As we say, let's pray that our robes will be white. Let's pray that we'll be made ready to meet him on that day. And if you're here today and you're already a Christian, but you got some sin in your life, you're struggling, and you need prayer, the Bible still says that the prayers of the righteous, they are merely much. And I already said, all, not y'all, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And if you're God's child, you have a father that's really ready, willing, and able to forgive you of your sins if you would, but only ask. So my brother, my sister, if you're here today and you're subject to the invitation, don't put off tomorrow. For, don't put off today for what you plan on doing on tomorrow. Tomorrow, this afternoon, is not promised to us. The only time and opportunity that is promised to you is what you have right now. Take advantage of it, and if you may need to make a decision for Christ, you can do that now. Together we stand and sing the song of invitation. I was thinking.